My name is Nora Katz, and I'm the Director of Heritage and Interpretation at the Goldring Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life in Jackson, Mississippi. In 2020, like a lot of people, I was panicking. I spend a lot of time traveling across the South, leading groups on Southern Jewish heritage tours. And of course, those ground to a halt when COVID hit. I had this idea to create a series of videos and live streams sharing stories about the people and places I'd normally visit on tours to give people a taste of the Jewish South from the safety of their homes. And I have to be honest, it got kind of out of hand. <laughs> 30 episodes later, this is a full-fledged show that has featured so many luminaries from the Southern Jewish community. It turns out it's not really a virtual vacation anymore, so we're doing a rebrand. I am honored to officially welcome you to Southern and Jewish, a video podcast from the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. We are so thrilled to announce this exciting change for the show. It's got a new title, Southern and Jewish, that better reflects the breadth and depth of the series. Plus, it's now available for download on your favorite podcast platforms. The engaging visuals you know and love will still be here, with the added bonus of being able to listen on the go. Our next episode comes out on June 6th on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. It's a conversation with Lowen, a Nashville-based songwriter, performer, and music producer who grew up in South Florida. We spoke about how growing up Jewish has influenced her music and the importance of collaboration in the creative process. She even played a few of her songs for us. I am so excited for you to hear Lowen's music. Catch that episode on the podcast feed and stay tuned throughout the summer as we re-release our legacy episodes. We've spent three years telling nuanced and engaging stories about what it means to be Southern and Jewish, shining a spotlight on our region's music, art, culture, and foodways. You know, in New York and Los Angeles, it's every third person's Jewish and it's like every man for himself. Here, we basically have our own shtetl over here and it's definitely where everybody helps everybody. I didn't know anybody when I came down here, but everybody welcomed me with open arms. We have become an institution here in Houston. And I'm so grateful for the wisdom of our ancestors who understood that humans are so uh, quick to say, this is mine. I put a fence around it. I worked for it. I planted it. Selling this is gonna feed my family or send my kids to school, it's mine. Humans are so quick to do that. And Shemitah teaches us not so much. Like, no, actually this is ours. It's for the collective. And we forget that at our peril. We forget that at our peril. And I love the reminder of Shemitah to really dig back into the collectiveness of land and of food and to seek more and more ways to affirm, no, it's not mine, it's ours. That's a great takeaway about the Emmett Till story, not just the facts and figures of Emmett Till um, and the bravery of Mamie Till, th those are all important, but what do we learn about this in terms of how the system works, what needs to change, um, how we need to be educated or educating our children about this important that important moment in history and other important stories that have been erased. Not only are, is the work that's been done and that continues to be done in Mississippi um, fighting a, a force of white supremacy that has been overwhelmingly powerful, but there has been resistance to that oppression that has been righteous and um, um, it holds lessons for us all. I think there's a real opportunity um, for Jews to make an impact um, on justice issues. By ourselves, we are tiny, um, even smaller proportion um, in the South and in other places in the country. But when we join together with other folks um, who are um, who are traditionally marginalized or are minorities, there's a lot of opportunity for us um, to um, make make a big impact. And so the process of figuring out what kind of queer am I really was a Southern, a Southern born process. The whole piece of coming out as a trans woman and discovering that I was transgender was really born out of that 
our community here and of that work. When I got to know older trans women, because we're doing interviews with them uh, for our for history, uh, for the Queer History Project, you know, after, by the time we got to maybe the third uh, elderly trans woman that the project had interfaced with, it just hit me like a pile of bricks that I was like, I was hearing their story I was hearing was also mine. The work of thinking about queer history in Southwest Virginia was fundamental to me figuring out who I am and how I want to live. Of course, there's like the impulse that I think so many of us have to tell our own family stories, um, but also maybe because they felt like they weren't being told by other people. And so they, you know, kind of took matters into their own hands and, and wrote their own histories. And all of, all of the research that I did, all of the sources that I used were generated by members of these communities. And, you know, it's still the case. I mean, there's still people, I, you guys have talked to some of them, I'm sure, who are doing, you know, great work on their own communities or their own families. And, um, you know, I'm glad that scholarship, the ivory tower is starting to catch up a little bit. We hope that you'll subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and leave us a review so that we can continue to grow the show. As always, the show will remain available for free on demand on our website. We can't wait to share more stories from the Jewish South. Now on Southern and Jewish, a video podcast from the ISJL.